Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, the chair of this committee. We are joined today by uh, Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr., who is always the first one here, and Council Member Andy King, both of the Bronx. Uh, we have a quorum, and today we will be holding five public hearings and a vote on four projects. The applications we will be voting on were subject to prior hearings. We will vote to modify the West 108th Street uh, WSHFSSH Wish Fish Rezoning, Land Use Items 52, 53, and 54 in Council Member Levine's District in Manhattan. Applicant HPD seeks a zoning map change, a zoning text amendment to map the area as a mandatory inclusionary herring housing area, utilizing option two and an urban development action area project approval, including the authority to sell city-owned property for this project. If approved, the community facility containing 119 supportive and 79 affordable resident units would be developed, as well as a new transitional shelter with approximately 110 beds and replacement ambulance parking. In later phase of the project, approximately 80 senior housing units would be developed. Our modification will remove mandatory inclusionary housing option two and add mandatory inclusion option one which provides for 25% of floor area for households averaging 60% of AMI with 10% at 40% of AMI. We will also be voting to, mo th this project has the support of Council Member Levine. We will also be voting to modify Park Haven rezoning land use items 55, 56, and 57 for property located in Council Member Ayala's district in the Bronx. HPD seeks approval of a urban development action area project, designation project approval, and disposition of city-owned property. Also seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area and zoning text amendment to designate the project area as mandatory inclusionary housing, utilizing mandatory inclusionary housing option two. These actions will facilitate the development of an 11-story mixed-use building with approximately 170 units of affordable housing, a fresh food supermarket, a community facility space, our modifications will remove MIH option two and add MIH option one, which provides for 25% of the floor area for households averaging 60% of AMI with 10% at 40% of AMI. We will also be adding the deep affordability option. We'll be voting to approve land use item 50, and this item also has support from council member Ayala. We'll be voting to approve land use item 58, the 500 West 174th HDFC tax exemption for property located in Councilmember Rodriguez's district in Manhattan pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. This 40-year tax exemption would not only facilitate the renovation of the building but also remove the property from the list of buildings slated for third-party transfer around 10 floor closure actions. Uh, and uh, I have a, uh, a message from Councilmember uh, Rodriguez indicating that he supports this project. Last, we'll be voting to approve land use item 59, the 1721 Van Sicklin tax exemption for property located in Councilmember Barron's district in Brooklyn. Pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, this 40-year tax exemption would not only facilitate the renovation of the building, but also remove the property from the list of buildings slated for third-party transfer around 10 foreclosure actions, and that is supported by Councilmember Barron. I will now call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of local council members to approve the Forget the interruption. We've just been joined by Council Members Levine and Ayala. I will call for a vote in accordance with recommendations of local council members to approve the modifications I've described. The West 108th Street rezoning land use items 52, 53, 54, and the Park Haven rezoning land use items 55, 56, 57, and to approve the West 174th Street land use 58 and Van Sicklin land use 59 tax exemptions. We're going to call the roll of those who are currently here. We're going to leave that vote open. And while we are waiting for additional members to show up and vote, we will go to Council Members uh, Levine and Ayala for statements in support of the projects. Council, please call the roll. Chair Kalos. Aye on all. King. Aye on all. Diaz. Aye on all. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Council Member Levine for a statement followed by Council Member Ayala. Well, thank you, Chair Kalos, and thank you for your partnership in bringing this to the finish line, a uh, very, very important uh, disposition in my district. Um, thanking 
thank you for helping us secure guarantees about the long-term affordability of this project. I do want to say a few words about why I decided to support this project on 108th Street, which um, will bring 281 units of 100% affordable senior supportive and family housing um, to a block where it's sorely needed, in addition to uh, rebuilding and slightly expanding uh, a very well-run homeless shelter on that block. This project will bring many, many benefits for the community, including a 6,000 square foot community health clinic run by the Institute for Family Health, a community meeting space on the ground floor, a garage for the ambulances of the Central Park Medical Unit, and there is an adjacent playground, the Aviles Playground, which will also receive many benefits, including creation of a comfort station as part of the new building, renovation of the western part of the playground to create a sitting area for seniors, and storage space for a local preschool, the Bloomingdale Family Program, that uses the park. There's also a large public school across the street from this project, MS-54, which will receive a very important benefit, which is that the Parks Department is committed to replacing uh, the extremely worn out synthetic turf field uh, adjacent to the school. Uh, we've secured full funding for this project and anticipate design will start next month. And in partnership with the local community board, CB7, um, we've established a construction monitoring committee with representat representation from the school to monitor the impact of construction on the local school and other um, nearby areas. And finally, we've made considerable efforts to mitigate the loss of parking that will result from the closure of the garages now operating on this site. Uh, in my request, DOT is committed to converting West 104th Street between Amsterdam and Manhattan Avenues to create angle parking, which will result in a net gain of approximately 33 spaces. Uh, we expect that the pavement markings and signage work uh, on this street will um, be put in place this summer pending consultation with the community board. I really want to commend the nonprofit developer of this project, uh, the Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, aka Wishfish, uh, which is uh, an incredibly well run agency, which has a great track record in our community and really did a stellar job at shepherding this project uh, forward so far, and I'm pleased to be partnering with them. And I want to thank uh, land use staff, which did a lot of work on this project and really was an incredible partner to me and my team, including Raju Mann, Amy Levitin, Julie Lubin, Jeff Ewan, and my own chief of staff, Aya Keefe, who worked very, very hard um, with her us usual uh, brilliance uh, to bring this project uh, to this point. So I am grateful to the committee members who have voted yes so far and want to encourage the remainder of the committee members uh, to follow suit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Levine. That is quite a long and impressive list of concessions and wins for your community. Council Member Ayala. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I am also here very excited uh, about a project in my district, the Park Haven uh, rezoning. It's an affordable housing development going up in the uh, South Bronx part of my district at 335 St. Anne's Avenue. Um, this project actually started before I became council member, so I inherited uh, this project, but I am very excited about it because I think that it sets a, a really uh, interesting precedence in terms of how we develop affordable housing in the city and that it sets aside 30% of the units for families that are currently homeless. And I think that all future development should include a set aside, even if it's a minimum of 10%. And in this case, we have a 30% set aside, which is um, astronomical. I am really excited about that. But it also, I think I wanted to thank the developer and HPD and the land use uh, staff for uh, their assistance in, in trying to navigate how we not only develop and m ensure that we have units for those that need it the most, but that we're also not doing it at, this, you know, at the expense of the adjacent community. This lot was uh, a vacant lot for many years. It was actually used uh, by the adjacent church um, for uh, parking and, and, and other activities. 
Um, and it's important that the community that lives there and resides there also have say in terms of what's developed and that they are a part of that process. And I think that this project captured that really nicely. Um, I appreciate you know the, uh, the time and effort that it took. I know it wasn't easy, um, but I appreciate you working uh, with me until we you know arrived at a, at a place where we were all uh, satisfied with the end result. Um, this project is also so on, to on top of the 30% set aside units for homeless individuals, we're getting 10% at 30% of the AMI. 10% at 40% of the AMI, 10% at 50% of the AMI, 20% of the units will be between 60 and 70, and 20% between 70 and 80. And I think that uh, it speaks to the community that lives there. Um, so I appreciate it and thank you very much. And I wish you much success. But there is a lot of conversation I just wanted to add on the record that I wanted to uh, have a further discussion, you know, about. Um, you know, jobs that are generated through these projects, right? And the uh, Make ensuring that we're paying a living wage um, when possible. Where you know a council that has been negotiating raising the minimum wage for the last you know few years, and in in a couple of years the minimum wage will be at fifteen dollars an hour. And I think that you know for uh, for jobs, that especially jobs that benefit from such a deep subsidy, um, that we're talking about ensuring that those individuals that work these positions that live in these communities are making an honest living wage. So I thank you very much and look forward to that discussion. I will ask the committee council to continue the uh, roll. Gibson. Aye. 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 The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, zero negative and no abstentions and referred to the full land use committee. One of our land use uh, committee, sorry, one of this committee's members is actually uh, in Israel on council business as part of a delegation trip. Uh, wish, we wish him all the best and uh, ask that he uh, leave our, our names at the uh, uh, Western Wall and uh, we'll continue on with the uh, hearing. And the vote is closed. We'll now move on to our public hearings on land use to items 64, 65, 66, 67, and 69. The Bethany Place House tax exemption Land use item 68 will be laid over. The first hearing will be on land use item 65 and the 1490 Southern Boulevard application for property located in Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. HPD seeks approval for the designation of an urban development action area and approval of an urban development action area project, UDAP. The project area is zoned R7-1 with a C-4 overlay. The approvals would facilitate the redevelopment of the site into a 10-story mixed-use building containing approximately 114 affordable independent residents for seniors with a percentage set aside for formerly homeless and superintendent's unit. A nonprofit would provide supportive services for seniors as well as on-site property management services. There would also be a ground floor community facility space and a year or charge for residents. Now open the public hearing for on this item.
first panel, please um, state your names for the record, and I'll swear you in. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Jill Crawford, Type A. Annie Churchwell, Type A. Ted Weinstein, HPD. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Okay. Yes. Okay. You may begin. All right. Um, LU number 65 consists of the proposed project to be developed on, city, on a city-owned vacant lot at block 2981, lot 14, known as 1490 Southern Boulevard in the Bronx Council District 17. In um, 1985, the Department of General Services completed a land use review procedure action to approve the unrestricted disposition of 110 parcels in the borough of the Bronx, including the project area. Currently, a sponsor selected by HPD through a competitive solicitation proposes to develop the site under the Senior Affordable Rental Apartments Program, or SARA. Under SARA, HPD provides gap financing in the form of low interest loans to support the construction and renovation of affordable housing for low income seniors. Projects developed with SARA funding must also set aside 30% of units for homeless seniors referred by a city or state agency, typically the New York City Department of Homeless Services. The building will be 10 stories and upon completion there will be 112 rental units plus one unit for a superintendent as well as a community facility space. The building comprises 75 studios and 39 one bedrooms in accordance with program guidelines. The project has been awarded project-based Section 8 vouchers for all residential units, which requires all tenants to pay 30% of their income toward rent and caps incomes at 50% of the area median income AMI. There will be a rooftop terrace and adjacent exercise room, ground floor community room, laundry room, and bike room. There will also be a large outdoor garden uh, and enhanced outdoor lighting for neighborhood security. There will be on-site support services as well as property management that will be provided by the Jewish Association Serving the Aging, JASA, one of New York's largest and most trusted agencies serving older adults in New York City. The project also envisions approximately 3,800 square feet of ground floor community center space that will be operated by the LGBT network. The network centers are a safe space and life-changing resource for thousands of LGBT and individuals from youth to seniors that seek their services. In order to facilitate development of the project, HPD is before the council seeking uh, urban development action area UDAP approval under the general, general municipal law for the 1490 Southern Boulevard project. And I'm here with the developers from Type A and I'll turn it over to them for their presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Jill Crawford, and this is my partner, Annie Churchwell, from Type A Real Estate Advisors. We are a certified women-owned business and a New York City-based emerging development company. We're here this afternoon because Type A was designated through HPD's MWBE Building Capacity RFP last year as developer for 1490 Southern Boulevard in Bronx Community Ward 3. Just to introduce Type A, Although we fit firmly into the category of emerging developer, Annie and I, along with our partner Andrea Kretschmer, collectively have decades of experience uh, building and preserving buildings across the city, including developing more than a million square feet of public schools and charter schools, creating and preserving more than 600 units of affordable housing, building community centers, restoring houses of worship, and restoring public parks and playgrounds across the city. Much of our work has been in the Bronx. Um, we've developed schools that serve more than 2,000 Bronx children um, and, and preserve many affordable housing units. We've also worked with DREAM, an organization formerly known as Harlem RBI, to rebuild public parks, including Patterson Park in Mott Haven. Um, these photos show Hyde Leadership High School, which was, one of the which was the first high school built on the Hunts Point Peninsula in 30 years, which we worked on together with Cliff Van Voorhees, who's here to testify today. Bronx Charter School for the Arts, uh, Patterson Playground in Mott Haven, and also the Bronx Point development, which we're working on with LMI. At 1490, we're proposing to build an affordable senior rental building. 1490 is a city-owned site, as you heard, along the Southern Boulevard corridor, which is 
largely zoned for commercial and residential properties. Um, here's an aerial view of the site as well. Okay, there we go. It's a 15,000 square foot site and currently occupied by an abandoned 9,000 square foot building that will be demolished in the coming months. Um, in keeping with the surrounding area, it's zoned R71 with a C24 commercial overlay, and it's sandwiched between the elevated subway and uh, an outcropping of bedrock on the western property line of, of the site. Uh, it's a bit of a tight site, but the good news is that it's very well served by the transportation. Uh, the Freeman Avenue subway stop is a block and a half away, and bus lines run up both Southern Boulevard and the cross streets on either side. When we were given the, the opportunity to submit a proposal for 1490, uh, we wanted to address what we believed were among the most urgent needs in the community. So in addition to working with the LGBT network to open a community center where there has not been an LGBT center in the borough of the Bronx since 2010, uh, we've also, we also chose to work for seniors uh, because as we, most of us know, I think here, uh, seniors are one of the most rent burdened populations. We know that seniors, one in five seniors is living in poverty, and there are nearly 200,000 seniors on waiting lists with an average wait time of seven years. We also know from our partners at JASA that uh, the majority of their tenants living in the 202s that they own and manage have incomes between $12,000 and $16,000 a year and pay rents around $245 to $345 a month. Most of these seniors are not eligible for tax credit, traditional tax credit properties because the minimum income requirements are above 50% of AMI. These are the numbers that motivated us to put together the project, the proposal that we did, um, particularly because in CB3, where the project is located, 85% of seniors are eligible for Section 8 vouchers. So at, at uh, 1490 Southern Boulevard, we're proposing to build a 10-story, 100% affordable rental building with 115 units. It's 75 studios. Uh, 39 one bedrooms and a s one set aside two bedroom for a living super. All of the units will be affordable to senior headed households earning up to 50% of AMI and supported by project based vouchers. We're very pleased to be supporting the administration seniors first initiative that was announced last year. Uh, in addition to the units themselves as Lacey mentioned there is a ground floor, floor community room laundry facilities and offices for JASA for both property management and tenant services on the ground floor. We have designed an eighth floor exercise room with a terrace on the setback roof that's designed for passive recreation. And there's a garden in the rear of the building which is designed for both active and passive recreation. And finally, in terms of design, we're paying particular attention. Oops, sorry, I can't get out of there. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. To um, transparency, sorry, to sound attenuation at the window wall uh, because of the proximity of the overhead subway and also to light and transparency on the ground floor. This is a particularly desolate stretch and we want our seniors to feel and be safe with additional eyes on the street. Um, it's Type A's intention to create a real community for our tenants and the opportunity for them to age and thrive in place. As our partners in this effort, we've engaged with JASA, again for both tenant services and property management. We chose to work with JASA not only because they're a 50-year-old nonprofit with, and one of the largest providers of services to seniors across the city in Long Island, as was mentioned, but because they own and operate seven of their own buildings and they, uh, are already, um, they already house nearly 2,400 low to moderate income New Yorkers. JASA has 11 standalone senior centers and 12 locations where they offer programs in the Bronx, including neighborhood shops Casa de Riqua, directly across the street from 1490 Southern Boulevard. Their experience in every aspect of senior care and they have deep experience um, supporting formerly homeless seniors living in mixed buildings. For tenant services, JASA has already applied for HRA's SARA Tenant Services RFP. The RFP, the RFP funding is currently the only funding available for tenant services for SARA projects which are by definition not supportive housing. As you can see on the long list of services, um, they intend to provide both on-site service coordinator and on-site service coordinator who will work with tenants for referrals and casework, but also everything ranging to social and community engagement type activities and programming to help introduce neighbors to each other, but also to the resources in the surrounding community. Um, this, this funding is based on the number of formerly homeless units set aside in the building. 
um, but it but the services are intended for everyone living in the building with the goal to have tenants continue to live independently maintain housing stability and successfully age and thrive in place we are incredibly excited to be working with the LGBT network at 1497 Boulevard as a 501c3 not-for-profit organization the LGBT network is nationally known for their work over the past 25 years with LGBT youth in the areas of education, advocacy, youth leadership, development and support, as well as for their work with LGBT folk across the lifespan. The network currently operates three community centers in Long Island, and on February 1st of this year, the organization opened a full service community center in Long Island City at 3718 North Northern Boulevard. These community centers are safe places and offer life-changing resources for the tens of thousands of LGBT individuals who pass through their doors each year. A representative from the network is here today with, who will more specifically walk us through the programming, their programming. In addition to their work to date in community centers, the network is currently working to establish and lead an outer borough LGBT services consortium in an effort to increase and coordinate delivery of health and human services for LGBT people and families in the outer borough. As a council speaker initiative, this exciting project will be conducted in partnership with organizations throughout the city and with the support of numerous elected officials, including the Bronx Borough President's Office and a series of Bronx-based organizations. By the time we open our doors in 2020, the LGBT Network's community center may well be the first bricks and mortar LGBT center in the Bronx since the closing of Boom Health Facility in 2010. As indicated previously, senior rent burden in New York City is staggering, particularly in Community Board 3, where 85% of seniors qualify for Section 8 project-based vouchers. As a result, this development is being financed using a combination of N New York City HDC tax-exempt bonds and subsidy, HPD SARA subsidy, and an equity investment from a tax credit investor. HPD SARA program is currently the only subsidy for low-income seniors that is appropriate for this demographic and this project. No 202 monies are currently available, and the project is too large for 9% credit. In addition, this project is not designed for seniors in need of supportive housing, for example, the chronically homeless or the mentally ill. With the allocation of Section 8 vouchers towards this project, tenants, will, tenants' rents will cap at up to 30% of their income. In a borough where 24% of the senior residents live below the poverty line, the subsidy is critical. We have looked to similar successful precedents in the Community Board for guidance, including Alembic 1880 Boston Road. In coordination with Hebrew Home of Riverdale, this project has also utilized, Sarah pro has utilized the SARA program and Section 8 vouchers to create an impressive 168-unit senior development. Type A Real Estate Advisors believe strongly in the power of developing projects deeply rooted in the communities in which they are built. They are healthier, more resistant, resilient, and happier places to live. At 1497, we are fully committed to engaging directly with the community as we begin to market the building. We will create a web of outreach, including local community boards, senior centers, houses of worship, and the offices of elected officials. We are committed to engaging with all community stakeholders. By working with JASA, we can access their extensive experience marketing their own senior housing projects across the city and those CB3 organizations that already have linkage agreements with Neighborhood Shop and the PSS Davidson Center. JASA is also already across the street from 1490 at Casa Barica offering services. But getting the word out is not where we plan to start or stop. By holding community-based seminars, workshops, and housing forums, we can truly educate, prepare, and assist applicants through the entire process, starting with financial literacy and credit work to the nitty-gritty of paperwork, submissions, and follow-up. We will get the word out early, often, early and often and sit one-on-one -on -one to assist where needed. We are fully committed to this process of community engagement and outreach. We are incredibly proud and pleased to have the support of our local community board on this project. As to timeline, we are 80% complete with construction documents and have anticipated closing on financing in December 2018. Once we close, we expect construction to last approximately 20 months and that building occupancy will occur in the fall of 2020. Thank you very much for your uh, detailed presentation. I wish all the presentations were uh, uh, this detailed. So um, first uh, question, 
just uh, for folks at home. So uh, I'll disclose that I am I'm Jewish. I used to be vice chair of the Jewish caucus. Uh, Jasa uh, appears to have the, the word Jewish in it. Is uh, this only for Jewish people? Uh, yeah, I mean, they have community centers and housing across the city that serves predominantly non-Jewish. So okay, so anyone can apply to this? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, and then in terms of the uh, other components of this, you're also going to be building a LGBT center. You're, there was one in the Bronx. It was led by Derek McCall when he went to work with the uh, borough president. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with him in his previous role and even in his new role, but that center ended up closing, so there would, this would be a new center. This would be a brand new center. Um, I think it's important to note that the, that the council members asked that, um, that the LGBT network work closely with existing um, LGBT um, organizations throughout the Bronx, and their consortium is the first place where they intend to do that. And so is this going to be exclusively for LGBT, or will other members of the community have access to the space as well? I think we can let Sean, who's here from the LGBT network, answer that. The community centers are open for everyone. Obviously, the program is geared towards not just LGBT members of the LGBT community, but also friends and family who um, are welcome as well as the entire community. I will say also that there's been an effort by JASA to work already with LGBT network on beginning to think about um, senior programming for, for seniors, residents in the building and in the community as well. Great, and uh, so, so just full, full disclosure, I, I, I'm an ally, but the number of times I've been to the center, the LGBT, it was previously the LGBT center, now it's just the center on uh, West 13th Street is not insubstantial. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is good that the Bronx will have a uh, similar resource. And so in your presentation, you provided a listing of all the various financing that uh, you expect to be receiving, uh, is that, is that the totality of the uh, funding? We have some two reservoir requests out currently, but in nothing in addition to that. We should okay. say that nothing is final until we close, but yes, that's our anticipation. Okay, so, you're so it's the HTC First Mortgage, HTC Ella Subsidy, HPD SIRA Subsidy, uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credit, that's federal dollars, and then Section 8 vouchers, is that project-based or is it tenant-based? Project-based. Okay, and that's through HPD as well. That's correct. So even though it's listed as federal, it's a city subsidy. Um, and then you also received the land uh, at what price? One dollar. Okay, so, and, and how long will this property remain affordable? The initial uh, agreement is, is a minimum of 30 years by the, by the term of this era uh, term sheet. Mm -hmm. But again, that hasn't been finalized, so at a, the minimum would be 30 years. Okay, and uh, would, would you be open to a, a longer affordability term? Yes, we would. Perfect, and uh, do you know what the, the all-in value of all the subsidies are? The all-in value of the subsidies are? The, the, the total development cost of the project? Yes. I think currently uh, it's around 60, 60 million, but again, it's early early pre-development so, so so estimate. so estimate around 60 million I, I see you're not seeking any tax abatement you would not be paying tax because you're a nonprofit or the uh, JASA will be part of an HDFC and will and will seek a tax abatement through the HDFC so there will be tax abatement layered in over this that's correct it, yeah the this project because it receives low-income housing tax credits and has a not-for-profit involved will receive 420C and that's as of right. Okay, fair enough. Do you, can, can you please sh share with our committee the uh, full value of the 420C and to, to the extent you're using additional mechanisms and vehicles to provide additional subsidy, this, this sounds like a great project, but I think uh, anyone who's watched this on TV and survived the opening before, uh, the goal here is to try to get a sense of just how much we as taxpayers are spending on this very worthwhile uh, type of project so that we can get a sense of just uh, if, if this is the, the best possible, making sure we have a project to hold things up to. Uh, and so you, you disclose that you are an MWBE. This was in response to an MWBE RFP. So you are the developer. What about 
other folks on the project in terms of the construction firm uh, and uh, the architect and uh, other parts of this project in terms of MWVE? Um, so um, n our architect is not an MWVE. Um, and nor, neither are our engineers. Um, we have very, um, we're in the process of um, organizing our MWVE strategy for uh, construction. Um, and I, I can't remember what we're our current uh, set aside for the number of, of MWVE contractors are. Is one of my colleagues, do you remember, Andrea? We're working our way towards the 25 to 30 percent uh, requirement for MWVE subcontractors on the project. Is it possible to exceed the minimum? So, um, so we've been in deep conversation with our contractors about that because it is a Section 8 project. It's union. It's a union project, and so mm -hmm. I understand uh, prevailing wage, and we will be using a union contractor for this project. We believe, and so. Um, Yes, we're working really hard towards it. I understand that there's, it makes it a bit harder, but we're, t as an MWVE, incredibly committed to pushing the line on that wherever possible. So, so HPD may have warned you about my, my, my next question, which isn't actually about whether or not it's, it's a union job or not, because uh, uh, th that's not quite appropriate, but I did want to make sure that folks on the construction site, uh, I'm curious, will they have health benefits uh, so that they get hurt on the job, they can go to a doctor, if something, God forbid, happens, will they have disability benefits? Will they be able to retire? Will they have pension uh, benefits uh, in, in building this site? So this is a prevailing wage job, and all of the, all of the workers on the construction site will be paid a, uh, prevailing wages with benefits. Great. And then once the site, is, and, and I guess, is there a, will you have local hire as well? Can folks who are in this neighborhood in the Bronx get jobs? Yes, and actually the contractor we intend to work with has a pretty significant presence already in the Bronx so we, and has recently done quite a bit of work. So we're, we anticipate that they've already got uh, some good um, tools on the ground to help us get local hiring, a local hiring effort started. Um, we've already spoken with a number of groups about doing just that. Um, so I think and, we're and if somebody is watching on TV at home right now and they're interested, how would they uh, get one of the local hire jobs? Today, they can just reach directly out to us, and we, okay. would, we would be the conduit to making that happen. But um, and, and so you're so Type A Real Estate Advisors, LLC. Yes. Perfect. Uh, and uh, I have to ask, why, why Type A? <laughs> See in our presentation. <laughs> it was a very detailed If, if there were only more Type A's, I feel like uh, it might be. Uh, I, I think this is the standard. This is what every presentation should look like. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, this isn't, th there's no apology, like, own it. It was uh, a joke that stuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the name was a joke that stuck. That, that, that is fine. On, mm -hmm. Along the flip side, uh, when you open, uh, according to presentation, there will be folks providing support. I imagine, uh, I don't know if you're going to have building service workers, but will those folks also have health benefits, disability benefits, a pension, a, a wage that they can afford to live in that's commensurate with other people doing similar work? Yes, the, em the employees in the building will actually be uh, employees of JASA, but they and JASA employees are paid living wages and have benefits. Um, we can let the LGBT network answer directly for themselves also for their employees that will be in their building, but we believe that the answer is also in affirmative there. Uh, one of the items that we became aware of and no one had ever heard of until this administration, until last term, was these things called deed restrictions. Uh, seeing that the property is being provided uh, to you for the purpose of senior housing and for nonprofit community use serving an LGBT community, would you be uh, open to having a deed restriction so that if in 40, 50, 100 years uh, you, you are not there anymore, that the property can continue to serve the community in the same way? I, yes, I think that um, it's important to note that the building is being designed under the AIRS zoning, so it is already restricted to seniors for in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it was our intention to build it for the purpose of senior housing going forward. Great. Uh, additionally, so the other questions are uh, 
Uh, can you describe any outreach or marketing efforts you plan to use to help seniors in the neighborhood access these units? And similarly, this one's for HPD, uh, which is just how does HPD plan to work with the Department of Social Services to match households to units set aside for formerly homeless households? Um, so on the marketing um, end of things, one of the reasons we're so pleased to be working with Joss is because they have a number of their own buildings and also feel that strong community engagement on the marketing side um, creates stronger community-based projects. And so JASA has already um, started working outside of this project with both neighbor Neighborhood Shop and the PSS Davidson Neighborhood Senior Center. We have already reached out to the council member and, our, and as well as the community board and have a number of senior centers that we're working with the council member on approaching as part of our marketing outreach. Um, one of the things that we realize that it's just not outreach, but there's also a fair amount of financial literacy assistance with applications because of the senior population. JASA has a lot of experience working with this population in not just understanding that the project is going up, but making themselves ready to be um, ready to apply as part of the lottery. And so uh, we plan to get the word out through a myriad of uh, senior-based organizations as well as houses of worship and community organizations, and then also work with people to understand what the process entails. Um, and then on our end, um, I would just say that um, individuals who are being assigned to permanent housing through HRA um, express a borough preference, and that's something that the folks um, on our side who do the matching take very seriously because they know that um, two real uh, factors determining success uh, for that permanent housing are um, that someone can afford the place that they live and that they're living where they want to live. And I think you touched on it in your testimony, but this is right next to an elevated train with no hopes of ever being put underground. Uh, I. I residents on occasion ha have raised concern about why, why, why here, why not somewhere else, and if here, uh, isn't this going to be just one of those uh, type of made for New York uh, stories of the, the person in a unit and the trains going by, the, the apartment is shaking, the pots and pans are clinging, and <laughs> no one can hear anything, and I think we've all seen that TV show or that scene. It's one of those things that people use as a, Manhattan, as a New York City touch point. Well, I would say that it, we're not going to get away from the train tracks, um, but we have worked uh, very closely with an acoustician and our architects to create a window wall, a, a window condition and a wall condition that seeks to um, mitigate the impact of noise on uh, the units. Um, and in fact, our, our EAS sets forth minimum um, sound attenuation requirements that we must meet, and we are meeting uh, at a minimum meeting those requirements for indoor air indoor noise quality. So for a tenant, if the subway goes by and let's say they get into worse condition and make more noise, can they hear anything? Yes, <laughs> they'll hear the train, but they will also be able to live comfortably in the unit. I would, I would just want to add that the sound attenuation would be something that would be part of the mitigation required un under the environmental review. We, we have a, a building that I was somewhat skeptical of in my district, which is 100% affordable, and I think we did just an Article 11 in the air rights. And I, I was very skeptical. It's right on the entrance to the, sorry, the exit of the Queensboro Bridge. But uh, that project, I've, I've been in the units while people are honking and going yeah, by very yeah. quickly, and I couldn't hear anything. Oh. So uh, I, I did not expect it, and, and I don't think the tenants did either. So I, I believe it is possible with the, the double pane and insulation and then just making sure you put the insulation into the walls yep. as well. Actually, one of the things that we've been cautioned to do is to make sure that during construction that contractors in every unit at every vulnerable part of the window or wall um, have properly constructed, um, done their construction work. So that's another part of our plan. We've done a lot with HPD. In fact, I probably got on the off on the wrong foot with HPD on uh, concerns of seniors who aren't interested in being in studios, uh, particularly because uh, first, often you have a senior couple 
where they, they would like to have a, a one bedroom and a studio is very tight for one human being, let alone two human beings. Similarly, if a senior needs a home health aid, they can't get one in a studio. So I see that a predominant amount of, uh, of these units are studios instead of one bedrooms. Would you be able to reallocate this so that there were predominantly one bedrooms or even uh, two bedrooms so that a senior family has a room for themselves as well as for home health aid or other family members who do have intergenerational housing as well? Can I take that? I, I'm more sure. focused on the one bedrooms. Yeah. I think it would be our preference to have more one bedrooms in the project. The, un the unfortunate reality is that the financing is based on the number of units and the cost of the project, whether we, we're building the largest building we can build in this, on this piece of property per zoning. And we have looked at it in all different configurations and um, to reduce the number of studio, we have to take out a m fair number of units to get to more one bedrooms than studios and it has a pretty serious impact on the, our ability to make the financing actually work. What would you need to get to more one bedrooms? The Sarah program actually allows um, folks uh, studios and one bedrooms. We encouraged actually in this case um, as many one bedrooms as financially were feasible. There is a difficulty for this project. Well, first there's a demolition that has to happen of an existing building. There is a retaining wall in the back. Um, there's a lot of rock. So this is not a simple vanilla type of construction. And so we encouraged them and they were very responsive about putting in as many one bedrooms um, as financially feasible. What's the demolition and site cleanup cost? I don't know. Uh, HPD is conducting yeah. that work. So, so, but HPD is already doing the work, so that's off book. That wasn't that the that wasn't the site at the beginning of the process. Okay, so now we're at a place to revisit. So HPD has stepped in, done the work, willing to do the demo. So, can we get more one bedrooms in? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, no, no. If you wanna, we've. Th th I mean, this we've isn't. Uh, this yeah, sounds yeah, no, like it's more of a council yeah, yeah. HPD question versus. Uh, yeah. Developer council. So, um, you know, we are certainly um, responsive to the development community that we're working with. Um, a lot of the project, the Sarah projects that have been funded so far, are being developed by experienced senior housing providers. Um, but the prevailing wage construction costs are incredibly expensive, and oftentimes we do end up having to reduce the number of one bedrooms to make uh, the numbers uh, to make the numbers work. Uh, even when we're going over subsidy, we still need to make sure that. There are enough income generating units uh, to uh, pay for the cost of the community space that's required for the air zoning. Um, and also we um, you know, feel really um, beholden to create as many senior units as we possibly can. There are an incredible number of seniors waiting for units. Are, so are it's an issue that we take seriously, but we need the balance. Are these 450 square foot studio units or these MIHCQA 300 or something tiny micro <coughs> senior units? These are not, um, these are not supportive housing size micro unit type units. They're generally around three, 400 square feet depending on the configuration of the building. Sometimes we end up with units that are slightly larger. Sometimes we end up with units that are slightly smaller, but we're generally looking to see 350 to 400 units, 400 square feet. I think we're actually exceeding all of the MIH requirements. So to be, that we, I can get you the exact numbers, but uh, the borough president's office asked us the same question and we currently exceed MIH minimum. Thank, thank you, I, I was not, I think they wanted to go even further down. I think they went, wanted to go down to 250 and I think I, held the line and I believe uh, my colleague, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso played a role in holding that line against the city wanting to get too far, but I would just say that. So if HPD can get back to us with the financing term sheets and help us understand why we can't do more one bedrooms, it seems that we have alignment from the developer who's interested in doing so if we can get the financing to work out. Does that sound right? 
It sounds right, except that we have spent a lot of time already trying to get that unit mix to work with the financing. So sure, of course, except we Perfect. have spent a fair amount of time working on it already. So Absolutely. Uh, thank you. This was an amazing panel. You came very well prepared, and I hope the rest Wait, of them today. Wait, there's a whole other panel. <laughs> there, there's, there's four more, so uh, <laughs> hopefully the rest have the same level of uh, detail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel is in support. Uh, we have Stephanie Ruiz from Live On New York, Tiffany Sims from Dream, uh, Sean Collins from the LGBT Network, and we have Clifford Van Voorhees representing himself. If all four folks could please submit their testimony to the Sergeant at Arms and please have a seat at the table. In many of these cases, uh, many of you have been working on this for years, sometimes decades, sometimes lifetimes. Uh, typically, as the hearings get longer and longer, we cut the time down to two minutes and one minute. Uh, we've been trying a noble experiment as I've been here to give folks five minutes. I'm asking that you not necessarily use the full five minutes, uh, but uh, please uh, give your testimony and take as much time as you need. I just feel that it's only right to try to give people as much and just know that there's four other projects coming so you do not have to use. Okay, so we have Andrea uh, Kretschmer, who is on behalf of, uh, who is from Type A Real Estate as terms of disclosure, but is reading testimony from JASA into uh, the record. And if you can just, as you will let the other folks testify first, if you can strike out portions and try to give a quick sure. summary and submit it on the writing. Uh, whoever would like to go first is welcome. Good afternoon, Subcommittee Chair Kalos. My name is Stephanie Ruiz, and I am an intern at Live on New York. Live on New York supports the development of affordable senior housing with services at 1490 Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. This project would support the entire community and aligns with our mission to make New York a better place to age. The on-site senior-specific service provider, JASA, is a member of Live on New York and an active member of our affordable senior housing coalition. New York City faces an unprecedented presented affordable housing crisis, one that affects every community throughout the five boroughs. As found in Live on New York's 2016 study, more than 200,000 low-income seniors in New York City languish on wait lists for affordable housing through the HUD 202 program. The average wait time for these units, an astounding seven years. For seniors, the dire need for affordable housing cannot be overstated, as rent burden often leads to adverse life choices such as skipping meals or medicine to afford rent. As cost of living continues to rise and New York City's vacancy rate is around 3%, the affordable housing crisis is exacerbated and becomes particularly difficult for seniors who are often living on fixed incomes. The inclusion of services to be provided by JASA for the formerly homeless senior tenants, as well as the entire building of seniors, is a critically important component to this housing opportunity. Access to services for seniors can lead to a better quality of life, including improved health outcomes and lower costs associated with hospitalization. JASA has a long history of helping seniors with housing and services, consistently working to promote safe communities and ensuring that seniors can age with dignity and respect. In fact, next month, JASA is celebrating its 50th anniversary of providing community-based services to older New Yorkers. Further, Live on New York is proud to support the inclusive nature of this building as a 3,800-square-foot community center operated by the LGBT network will be a resource to the entire community. 
We know there are many important factors to consider when making decisions that affect the community, and we greatly appreciate you keeping the needs of seniors in mind when making these policy considerations. We also appreciate the focus and prioritization of City Council and the de Blasio administration on affordable senior housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of 1490 Southern Boulevard. Good afternoon, my name is Sean Collins and I'm here on behalf of the LGBT Network and its CEO, David Kilnick, to speak in strong support of the project by Taipei Real Estate Advisors, LLC, to develop the property located at 1490 Southern Boulevard. Upon completion, the LGBT Network plans to occupy approximately 3,800 square feet on the ground floor of this building with a large presence on the street. A little bit about the LGBT Network. We are an association of nonprofit organizations working to give a home and a voice to the LGBT communities of New York City and Long Island. Our four community centers in Long Island City, Woodbury, Bayshore, and Sag Harbor provide safe spaces for LGBT people and their families to be themselves, stay healthy, and change the world. For 25 years, we have been pioneers in advocacy and social change, not just in our 35 programs that serve tens of thousands of families each year, but also our visibility and work in schools, workplaces, organizations, and the greater community, engaging more than a quarter million people annually. The LGBT network currently employs approximately 40 people at its four community centers, and all staff, including those who would be hired to work at our New Bronx facility, are paid a living wage with benefits. The New Bronx LGBT Community Center at 1490 Southern Boulevard will support our organization's mission to provide a home and a safe space for the LGBT community, as well as the ally community, and will support our ongoing efforts to advocate for equality wherever LGBT people live, learn, work, play, and pray. We expect to offer a number of programs and services in the areas of youth leadership and development, parent and family support, immigrant family support, HIV and STI prevention and health promotion, individual support, community building, and older adult services. We are also leading the development of an Outer Borough LGBT Services Consortium in partnership with the Brooklyn Community Pride Center, the Pride Center of Staten Island, and a leadership table of several organizations in the Bronx in order to identify the service needs and gaps, advocate for increased access to LGBT affirming and affordable health care, and create a safety net of coordinated resources in order to eliminate LGBT health disparities, safety issues, and inequities. One key outcome of this proposed consortium, which has the support of the borough presidents of each of the outer boroughs, would be an LGBT services needs assessment, which will help to further inform the programs and services which will be offered at 1490 Southern Boulevard and throughout the borough. The Bronx LGBT and ally community faces a unique set of challenges because they have been historically underserved, but we are confident that this investment in a physical home for the LGBT community will make real progress towards uplifting all families across the Bronx. Good afternoon. I'm Tiffany Sims, the Director of Capital Projects for DREAM, and I am pleased to provide this testimony in support of Type A's proposed development at 1490 Southern Boulevard in the Bronx um, as a prior client of Type A. Uh, DREAM is a 27-year-old community organization with a mission to provide inner-city youth with opportunities to play, learn, and grow. We use the power of teams to coach, teach, and inspire youth to recognize their potential and realize their dreams. In 1991, DREAM, then Harlem RBI, was founded when a group of volunteers transformed an abandoned, garbage-strewn lot into two baseball diamonds for youth in East Harlem. Over time, we began to address the greater needs of the community, like low literacy and high school graduation rates, first through summer and after school enrich enrichment, and beginning in 2008 through the DREAM Charter School. Today, we serve more than 2,200 boys and girls annually in East Harlem, the South Bronx, and Newark, with the unique program model that uses team-based methods to provide comprehensive, enriching experiences to young people. We are proud to say that 97% of our seniors have graduated from high school, 94% have been accepted into college, and 99% of our participants have avoided teen parenthood. From that first transformation of an abandoned lot on East 100th Street through the development of our first school at the base of an affordable housing tower on a former NYCHA parking lot in East Harlem, we are all too familiar with the critical and difficult difficulty of creating buildings that are worthy of the people and communities we serve. Type A was there from the beginning, has been there with us for a substantial piece of this journey, and we believe they are committed to the idea that beautiful buildings have the power to transform lives. Beginning with our K-8 building and headquarters in East Harlem, a seven-year public-private partnership effort that resulted in a brand new 500 student facility, headquarters for our staff, and volunteers, and 87 units of affordable housing. 
through the rehab of two NYC parks that Dream maintains and operates, and most recently, a fast-tracked, very fast-tracked renovation of our temporary high school space that now houses our first class of 109th graders. Type A has helped Dream solve our real estate challenges in the complex and expensive world of New York City real estate. They have tried to take the burden of real estate off our shoulders so that we can focus on the critical work of educating and supporting our dreamers and their families. We are pleased to see that Type A is expanding their focus to include affordable senior housing and providing space for the LGBT network to open a community center. We believe they will bring the same mission-driven, civic-minded approach to this new project as they bring to their work for DREAM. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cliff Van Voorhees, and from 2009 to 2011, I was the Chief Operating Officer of the Hyde Leadership Charter School, Hunts Point, South Bronx, and I worked extensively with civ civic builders and Annie Tershwell uh, on the development of a high school building for our school. Uh, just a few words uh, about our school. Today it's a K-12 school with 900 students, 95% of our high school students have graduated in four years and 95% have gone on to college. They're doing very well in college with lower attrition rates than the averages. And moreover, we now have our first uh, group of graduates, uh, among whom a couple of them I've been following uh, are now nurses and one is taking a master's degree in bioethics at Case Western Medical School. Um, a number of our students are also at John Jay uh, and I remember one boy in particular whose older brother was incarcerated when he was a student in our school. So my purpose today is to share my experience with Civic Builders and Annie Tershwell insofar as it may be relevant to the project you're considering. Our high school building was a turnkey project developed by Annie Tershwell and her Civic Builders team. Annie was a co-founder of Civic Builders and the SVP for real estate and is still on their board. This wonderful building was a newly built, 31,000 square foot, three-story, purpose-built built facility, and it was completed in 2011. The first challenge that Annie faced uh, was to find an affordable site close to our existing school. She managed a targeted site selection and acquisition pro process in coordination with us and respecting our priorities. I met with her several, at several possible sites before we collaboratively settled on 830 Hunts Point Avenue. Once the land was secured and purchased by her organization, Annie managed a collaborative design process with us, ensuring that our goals and school pedagogy and culture were prioritized and incorporated in the design. Our Hyde team has numerous fruitful design meetings with Annie and her architects. An integral part of this project was, of course, the financing and securing a 21 million new market tax credit that Annie's team managed with their partners making the high cost of new construction feasible for our school. Then came the construction of the building, which was also under Annie's purview. After a tightly managed process, she and her team completed the project on time and on budget. We had regular progress meetings and participated fully in making decisions to prioritize our options. We thank God that she was able to do this because our backup plans were really not very satisfactory. As the only college preparatory high school in Hunts Point, the facility houses 280 students and includes nine classrooms, a science lab, art room, weight room, common spaces, administrative offices, and a rooftop play area. You may note the absence of a cafeteria, gymnasium, and auditorium. This is an important example of the wise allocation of resources that Annie and Civic led us toward, a multi-purpose room which our students referred to affectionately as our Capagemorium. <laughs> While Hyde initially occupied the facility as a rent-paying tenant, they recently purchased the building from Civic Builders at below market rate. It was always clear to me that Annie and her associates at Civic Builders were committed to building strong communities through collaboration with carefully selected community partners. She and her associates were not at Civic to make money. They were there out of a passionate commitment to a cause they believed in making quality space available to support quality educations for underserved children. I can unreservedly recommend Annie to you as a developer who is responsible, high-performing, and committed to community strengthening. 
She is dedicated to doing worthy projects in an engaging and highly collaborative way. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Andrea Kretschmer. I'm a partner at Type A Real Estate Advisors and I'll be reading JASA's testimony into the record. They had an all hands board and staff meeting for the day and weren't able to attend. JASA is pleased to submit this testimony in support of Type A's proposed development at 1490 Southern Boulevard, where JASA will serve as both property manager and tenant services provider. JASA's mission is to sustain and enrich the lives of the aging in the New York metropolitan area so that they can remain in the community with dignity and autonomy. Since 1968, JASA has grown to become one of New York's largest and most trusted agencies serving older adults in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Long Island. They provide life-sustaining programs for seniors and are committed to maintaining affordable residential facilities that provide their tenants with a safe, secure, and accessible environment. JASA does more than simply put a roof over seniors' heads. They own and manage seven properties, providing subsidized housing to nearly 2,400 New Yorkers over the age of 62, who qualify as low and moderate income and or are disabled. A manager and social worker are on duty in every complex and several have on-site senior centers. Extensive, they have extensive experience helping seniors avoid housing instability and eviction, as well as working with formerly homeless seniors to promote their success living as part of a building community. JASA operates 11 standalone senior centers across the city, and has eight locations in the Bronx, including Casa Bariqua and PSS Davidson. Though these through these locations and referrals, JASA offers access to extensive services ranging from case management and counseling to home care, legal and financial services, meals, transportation, and crisis intervention. JASA's network serves 43,000 people citywide. For this proposed development, JASA has applied for funding for 1490 Southern under the provision of Senior Affordable Housing Tenant Services, RFP, an HRA opportunity that funds services at senior housing developed under the HPD's SARA program. The HRA, HRA grant is currently the only funding available for tenant services at 1490 Southern. Funding availability is uh, based on a $5,000 per unit set aside for formerly homeless tenant. However, at this building, services are intended to be offered to all tenants who reside in the building. The HRA funding initiative is designed to create a sense of community in a building that will be home to a mix of tenants, so those who are low income and those who are formerly homeless, as well as providing productive linkages to the immediate surrounding neighborhood. To meet the program's goal to enable seniors to live independently, maintain housing stability, and successfully age in place, JASA will draw on their experience with senior housing, senior centers, and naturally occurring retirement community programs, where group programs serve as an important means of creating community, promoting wellness, and social connectedness. 1490 Southern is an exciting opportunity for JASA to expand services in the Bronx, and to build on our successful track record of helping seniors across the city remain in their communities again with dignity and autonomy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe we are past the selection point. However, the testimony was glowing and uh, helpful. Uh, I guess the, the one question I will uh, give to, I believe, Sean is just uh, the uh, applicant had uh, Type A had deferred to you when I had asked about the nature of the programming, whether or not you'll work with other LGBT organizations, and whether or not the space or programming is restricted. And uh, just, I guess, the other piece is just, um, I, I know at the center a lot of their program relates to uh, uh, substance abuse, whether or not that is also restricted to the community, or and, and what portion of your programming you plan to have to what types of programs. Okay, so that was a lot of questions. There. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so let me start by saying, you know, we've uh, we've always served the entire community, um, regardless of the program or service. All of our programs and services are, are available to everyone. Um, as far as um, any restrictions on the space, no, we're going to be providing a full service community center. Uh, and we have been in conversations with uh, local council members, uh, the borough president's office as well. Um, and other organizations about collaborative efforts to provide services throughout the borough 
at 1490 as well, and really to um, you know, reduce any duplication of services and really streamline for the entire community. Um, and we're having a resource fair with uh, Council Member Salamanca in a couple weeks. Um, we're helping out with that. Um, we have uh, identified Boom Health and Destination Tomorrow as groups that we'll be working with uh, on the consortium and, and also going forward just on uh, collaborations with programming at 1490. Uh, will you work with predecessor organizations in the Bronx or what is your relationship? So we, we've been working uh, very well with Dirk McCall at the Borough President's Office. Uh, been a great resource in helping us uh, navigate you know, some of the, uh, the challenges and, and uh, really help us highlight some of the needs as well. Thank you very much, uh, and a uh, special shout out to Dream. You're in my district, yeah. so oh. thank you. I, I, your field is outside my district, but you serve my district, so I, rep I, I represent East Harlem as well. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I'll excuse the uh, panel and support. We have one uh, individual. Uh, we we have one appearance in opposition from uh, Panos uh, Kutris, I believe, uh, and it's he's here on behalf of SEIU 32 BJ. And I, I want to uh, commend the previous panel on that we did not hear the beep. Everyone used the time they had without uh, actually using all of it just because they had it. Uh, Panos, how do I pronounce your last name? Kutris. Kutris, okay, I was, I was as close as I could get. I'm it not actually Greek, it was, but it it's was a perfect. Greek last name, so thank you. It was perfect, thank you. Good evening, my name is Panos Kutris. I'm a building service worker and a member of 32BJ SEIU. I'm here today testifying on behalf of my union. 32BJ is the largest, pro uh, the largest property service workers union in the country. Many of us work in residential buildings like the one HPD and, and uh, 1490 Southern Owner LLC, an affiliate of Taipei Project, are proposing to develop at 1490 Southern Boulevard. I'm here to make sure the development team is committed to, create, uh, to creating high quality jobs at the site. 32BJ knows that affordable housing projects can also create good jobs because we represent the clear majority of workers in affordable buildings across the city. These workers receive family sustaining wages and benefits. Our union believes projects that receive this uh, discretionary tax subsidies uh, should also create good jobs. That is why we are calling on the city as well as the applicant to commit to funding and paying the industry standards prevailing wage for building service workers in the Bronx at 1490 Southern Boulevard. My union and I understand how important new affordable housing is for this neighborhood. A good jobs commitment is an important step towards ensuring that this development truly benefits the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you uh, ver very much. So you got it, and, and thank you for testifying. Do we have anyone else here to testify on this matter? Seeing none, I will now close the hearing on land use item number 65. I'll now open the public hearing on land use item 66, the PRC Tiffany tax exemption for property located in Charles Salamanca's district in the Bronx. HPD seeks approval of a, uh, of a new Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. This action will facilitate the development of a new eight-story residential building with 161 units of affordable housing in the Bronx. The project site is within an R7-1 zoning district, and the proposed eight-story mixed-use building with 161 affordable units would be developed as of right under zoning. Uh, I will now ask our council to uh, please uh, swear in our panel. Uh, please state your names. Marty Pearson. Ken Spielberg. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the tr truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. If all panelists could affirm, identify your names and affirm. We actually need you to say yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, please do a presentation. Well, you should be over here. We need a uh, slip for our third speaker, their name, and for them to also take the affirmation, please. Okay, 
Oh, sorry, Rick Gropper and uh, iFirm. You may begin. Uh, afternoon, Chair Kalos. Uh, I'm Marty Pearson from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Land use number 66 consists of an exemption area containing one multiple dwelling to be located at block 2713, part of lot two, and will be known as tentative lot 120 in the Bronx, Council District 17, and is known as PRC Tiffany. On May 27th, 2015, the council approved the dissolution of two Article 5 housing companies that merged and converted into a single Article 11 HDFC known as Andrews Kelly Housing Development Fund Corporation. The two housing developments were formerly known as Esperanza Village Associates located at 955 East 163rd Street and 970 Kelly Street and the Maria Estella two associates located at 1710 and 1730 Andrews Avenue. Currently, the sponsor proposes to construct a new building on underutilized vacant land under HPD's mixed income program, Mix and Match. In addition to vacant land, there's a parking lot on site that is being replaced elsewhere on the PRC Andrews site. PRC Andrews Avenue plans to lease the vacant land to the sponsor who will own and operate PRC Tiffany Project for the purpose of constructing new rental housing for low and moderate income households. The sponsor will construct an eight-story building containing 161 units with a mixture of unit types, including 11 studios, 83 one-bedrooms, 41 two-bedrooms, and 23 three-bedrooms plus a two-bedroom superintendent's unit. Additionally, 60% of the units are targeted towards households with incomes up to 60% of AMI. The balance serves incomes up to 100% uh, percent AMI with rents underwritten at 80% of AMI. So rents will vary between $215 for a studio to $1,910 for a three bedroom apartment. The building will be energy efficient and amenities will include a gym, a community room and laundry facility that will be, and they will all be at the uh, cellar level at 975 Tiffany Avenue. It should be noted that uh, both the elevators and stairs will provide access to the cellar and all three of the spaces noted above have frontage onto courtyard at solar level that provides natural light and air. The replacement parking is immediately south of its current location. Pedestrian access is provided to both the uh, 955 East 163rd Street and 970 Kelly Street properties, which is the PRC Andrews site. Additionally, there will be vehicular access onto the lot from both Kelly Street and Tiffany Street. Currently, there is an existing exemption on lot two However, the benefit will terminate on tentative lot 20. So in order to assist with maintaining long-term affordability of the new building, HPD is before the council seeking Article 11 tax benefits for tentative lot 20 that will coincide with a 40-year regulatory agreement for the development of the new building. And um, the sponsor has a um, presentation, which I will scroll, scroll through as he discusses what you're about to see. Do we have a copy for the record? We do. You, you, there you go. The sergeant at arms will take it and uh, you I'll may give begin. you extra copies. Perfect. Okay. So, thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Ropper, one of the principals of Canberra Property Group, and we, together with PRC, have proposed to construct a 161 unit affordable rental building on a parking lot that is uh, currently vacant land on. Uh, which was used for um, the development of two existing um, affordable housing buildings which were renovated. 975 Tiffany Street is, um, again, it's 161 units and it will be um, constructed using an Article 11 tax abatement as well as tax exempt bonds, tax credits, and subsidy from um, HPD and HDC. Um, the building is um, eight stories, and um, we are currently in um, process with DOB um, and are in, uh, in the midst of getting approval from, um, from DOB as well as from the city agencies. The Article 11 tax abatement, has, which has been proposed, is um, to exempt the property from uh, real estate taxes, um, and it is um, currently on a lot which, um, which houses 
houses parking, the parking will be replaced um, in connection with the construction of the new building. The overall program for the building um, is, uh, again, 161 units at um, different tiers of AMI. It will also have a fitness center, it will have community space and an outdoor garden um, with recreation space for the residents. Energy efficient features will include, oh, oh great. Uh, energy efficient features will include low flow, um, low flow fixtures, it will include daylight sensors and also motion sensors for um, the common areas to reduce the, uh, the energy consumption of the building. In terms of affordability, we've proposed according to the mix and match program uh, that HPD and HDC um, are, uh, are sponsors of. We're, we've proposed a range of AMIs between 27% um, uh, of AMI up to 80% of AMI. And um, they're in um, about five tiers as well as 10% uh, set aside for uh, formerly homeless individuals and families. And then the last two slides of the presentation are uh, more of an appendix that, that states the affordability for each of the AMI tiers as well as the proposed rent. Thank you very much. Uh, so to start with, uh, who owned the property that was split out to create your new lot? Who currently owns the property? So you, you had 955 East 163rd and 970 Kelly Street, uh, Esperanza Village Associates, and then in Maria Estella, two associates. So you had a, you, you have a total of three four buildings, uh, and then so those are all HDFCs, and then I, I'm guessing, how did you come to the property and at what cost? So, um, and, and Chuck, who represents PRC, which is our partner, um, can probably answer in more detail, but um, the existing buildings are owned currently by PRC. They're owned, there's a nominee owner, which is an HDFC owner, and PRC is the beneficial owner. Uh, so, okay. Is PRC a nonprofit or what is PRC? PRC is a for profit developer uh, as well, and Camber Property Group is, is also a for profit developer, both um, specializing in affordable housing. Okay, so PRC owned the four buildings, and do you, so you went to Department of Finance and you just subdivided your lots and then made sure that the buildings remain compliant. And because of the new MIHEQA, exactly. you no longer have parking requirements, so you just move parking around, and the new building doesn't have any new parking requirements, so you basically are taking the parking lot and putting it up there. Exactly. Yeah, using MI using ZQA, we're, okay. um, we're so, able so, to so make new, that happen. So no new costs, uh, thanks to MIHEQA. Uh, and how many people drive in the neighborhood that you are building this in? What is the driving index? Do you have one? Um, I don't know what that is, but we can we can look into it. So EDC and other agencies do studies of just how many people actually use or need cars. It was part of the MIHEQA study, so I'm just curious. And where is the closest transit point? Closest transit point is um, basically around the corner. Uh, and what is that? Um, it is the the five train at White Plains Road. Okay. Westchester App, sorry. Wrong project. Westchester mm -hmm. Ave, five train. Okay, and so there's an existing Article 11 tax exemption for the two existing buildings on lot two, which will be subdivided. How many units are in these two existing buildings? How long is the existing Article 11 exemption that covers these buildings? And what affordable restrictions are on those buildings? For the existing buildings. Right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask my colleague Chuck to answer those who represents PRC, the current owner. Perfect, we'll just need to administer, we'll need you to. So. What we're going to ask you to do, Chuck, is grab, a, if folks want to slide down or however you want to do it, and we will need you to state your name for the record, and we will swear you in. Yeah. 
Hi, hi my name is uh, Charles Brass. Uh, you can call me Chuck, though. Uh, from, uh, and I'm with Foresight Security Advisors. I'm a consultant for, for this development team and also for the PRC on the prior property. <coughs> The prior project was a Section 8 project uh, uh, that was developed actually in 19, uh, 1980s, uh, uh, early 1980s. And uh, in 2015, it was, it, it was renovated uh, with HDC bonds, tax credits, and uh, a new Article 11 uh, tax abatement from, uh, that the City Council uh, granted to the Section 8 project that went in conjunction with its renovation in 2015. So. And so how much is remaining? Uh, I believe that was a 40-year exemption, so uh, 37 years probably are, are still left on, on that uh, uh, project, uh, on, the, on that tax exemption. Okay, and then, so you've got these four buildings. They're all fairly new. They all have new tenants in them, and now they're going to be in a construction zone. How long is the construction, and what are you doing to mitigate uh, harms from construction? Well, uh, well the, the four buildings are, you know, they'll all be, uh, they're separated fr from, uh, uh, fr from this. Uh, there's only one building, really, that, that's n near, near this building, uh, there, and, and the... Uh, the contractor will take, uh, you know, proper mitigation methods to make sure that uh, uh, that they're uh, not disturbed. Uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be in wh whatever uh, steps are necessary to keep the construction will, will within the building. Will you agree to building. avoid after-hours variances unless it's mandated by DOB in order to do crane work if you need to? Uh, well, well, the the contractor uh, part is not here, but I believe they've already worked out agreement with the community board as to the schedule that they would that they, they would, would work okay. on. Okay, so. uh, that that is helpful. Uh, now to uh, the the more formal piece. So you have Article Eleven. Uh, do you know what the net present value? Is? And that's a forty-year Article Eleven, or thirty? It it'll be forty years. Forty years versus yeah. last time's thirty years. Let's see what we can do with ten years on that other project, HPD, to get me more one bedrooms. In terms of the tax abatement, what's the cash value for that over the forty years, or and as well as that present value? Uh, six million five eighty five one seventy three. Six million five eighty five one seventy three, and that is, I assume, full cost of the exemption. Yeah. Yes. And what is the net present value? Uh, it's forty thousand nine hundred two per DU. Forty thousand nine hundred two versus six point five million. Correct. That, I think that's an error. That's fair. It's fine. Uh, well, uh, you can look it up. I'll keep going. In terms of H HPD, you're getting the uh, mix and match subsidy. Uh, what else? What other subsidies are you receiving? It, it's we're, we're receiving subsidy from HPD, subsidy from HDC, low income housing tax credits, and uh, senior loan from HDC. So you have the LIT, LIHTC, and then HDC receiving which program? HDC under mix and match. Okay, so you're also doing the HDC layer of mix and match. Uh, Anything else from HDC? Uh, no, t uh, well, tax exempt bonds from HDC. Okay, give me a second. Thank you. Just trying to take notes on all the different things that we are uh, providing. So, tax exempt bonds. Do you know uh, what the value of those bonds are? The total, the total amount of the bonds. Yes. Yes. While he's looking that up, I'm going to provide you with the uh, cumu cumulative value of the tax exemption, which is twenty-five million seven hundred seventy-five, one thirty-five. Okay, so the six point five was the un yeah. net yes, present value. Yes, that's correct. So uh, this is something I had to learn. So basically, when we value things, we value them based on what would it cost in today's dollars versus what is the total over the uh, course of the years. And so that is the difference between a net present value where folks might say, well, it's only costing the city 6.5 million versus the full cost where I might say it's actually costing us 25.7 million. Uh, okay, so tax exempt bonds, how much? 
17.8 million. And that's from HDC? Yes. Okay. Uh, anything else? Nope, I said each HDC subsidy, HPD subsidy, and uh, low-income housing tax credits. Okay, so uh, no, no Ella? Nope. Okay. Uh, no HDC first mortgage, or is that covered by the tax exempt that, bonds? That's the tax exempt bonds. Perfect. In terms of the... Uh, Location, so in, in terms of uh, you as a developer, are you an MWBE or do you have management structure that includes MW uh, minority and women? We're not an MWBE, but we, we do have goals to hire M and WBE contractors in connection with the construction of the building. What is your goal? The goal, so the goal is actually a dollar goal and it's consistent with, H, um, with HPD's MWBE build up program. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the exact? I know what the goal is, but just explain it to me. It's a. Oh. That? Cool. We'll get you the exact number, but it's a 25% um, goal based on uh, uh, the way that HPD calculates the total dollars. So and, and, and you can meet that through the architect, the engineer, or construction? Yeah. We're planning to meet it. The majority of the way we'll meet it is through construction, and we um, we partner with the local community board. We partner with Building Skills New York, and um, we have uh, have developed a, a pretty solid pipeline of M and WBE contractors. And in addition to that, we also hire. Um, we set an internal target to hire thirty percent of all of the labor force locally. Oh, great! So you have a thirty percent local hire goal. Yes. Um, the, the total dollar amount for MWBE is $6.5 million, and that represents 25%. And just to save me a moment on doing the math there, that is, uh, what is the total project cost? The total cost is um, $58.7 million. Twenty-five percent of eligible costs that could be done by an MBE, MWBE contractor. So, so it's it's not an exact one-for-one one calculation. If that's what you're trying to do, uh, it's. I'm working on getting there. So the uh, next question, of course, is these jobs. It sounds great. Uh, will the folks have health insurance, disability insurance, and pension benefits on construction or operating your facility? So we're um, the project will be built non-union. And um, the, all of the employees on site will be paid uh, living wage. Um, the contractor will hire, is, is responsible for um, maintaining these requirements and for hiring all of um, all the subcontractors and for enforcing the living wage requirement. Okay, so not sure what non-union necessarily means in this context, so I guess, and, and then in terms of what living wage means, is that a $15? Minimum wage, or so I guess the, so so to to be clear, so you're not mandating health insurance or disability insurance or pension benefits for people doing the work or operating your facility. Again, it's it's um, the the contractor who's who's hiring the their local um, their their subcontractors, and um, and well, and what is living wage? Living wage is currently I think fifteen dollars an hour. So that, that's, that's not a living wage, that's a minimum wage, to, to be clear. I think living wage is, which is set by, um, has been set by a, a number of um, trade groups. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I, we can get back to you on that. It, that that's fine, I was just yeah. be, I, I being very precise. The, the, the building employee in the building will be uh, 30, it's a 32BJ building employee. Okay, so, so I, I am familiar with their contracts, so those folks will have health insurance, disability, yeah. and uh, pension benefits. So that, that is helpful, but so for the construction, not necessarily so. I, um, I think those are my uh, other piece, and so the, your tenants in 955 and 970 are okay with the new 
development. We, we ha held a public, uh, we gave them public notice, opportunity to comment, uh, and uh, you know, so there, we, we didn't receive any objections. Uh, just make sure you're speaking to the mic and do all the buildings have fitness centers and recreation rooms or just this new one? Just, just, just the new one. The, the original buildings were built in 1980, the Section 8, they had Section 8 standards <coughs> in 1980, so they, they don't necessarily, they have community, some of them have community rooms, but Will, will 955 not, uh, and 1960 tenants be able to access the fitness center at all or? Uh, in all honesty, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, and this is going to be a green community certified for energy efficiency. What does that mean in terms of LEED or other industry standards? Um, it's going to be green community certified, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be LEED certified. What is the difference I'm, I'm learning here? Um, I don't know what the exact difference is between LEED, but LEED basically is a system of points similar to green communities, but it's LEED is, is um, taking it sort of a step further and counting um, points for um, bike racks and walkability and stuff like that. So we're focused on green communities, which includes um, low flow fixtures, low VOC paints, um, active design guidelines, motion sensors for all of the um, public areas, Energy Star appliances. Um, sorry, just, just to add, um, Enterprise Green Communities is a one standard by which you, know, you get certified and LEED is another standard by which you get certified. Typically, uh, buildings that get certified for energy, uh, for, for um, Enterprise Green Communities are equivalent to LEED Silver but this project will not be seeking the LEED certification, which is a separate way of measuring. Okay, and so given that there is a 30% local hire commitment, if folks are watching at home and they're interested in a job on your project site and they live in the neighborhood, or even they live in one of the adjacent buildings, how do they get one of these jobs? We're, at a, uh, we're gonna have um, applications at the site office, which we're going to establish at 975 Tiffany. So anyone can stop by there. They can also go to the community board if, um, if they're closer to that community board office. And um, then from there, they're placed on a list. And we, as soon as we have a job uh, opening, when, um, when uh, we have one that's, that comes up, we go to that list and, and then find a person who um, is interested. If um, that candidate needs training, needs an OSHA card, for example, we would uh, work with local groups to arrange training and then um, get them onto the site. Okay, uh, so you, you heard it here first. Uh, go to 975 uh, to apply for the job. Thank you for building these uh, units. Please do consider uh, making sure folks who are working on your site have health insurance and uh, other benefits. I think it's important. And uh, thank you for your transparency in terms of the amounts of financing you're receiving. And uh, it's good to see that ZQA and MIH are actually creating new opportunities for affordable housing. So uh, thank you. I'll uh, do we have anyone else who wish to testify? On, we'll excuse this panel. Do we see anyone else who wishes to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, I will uh, close the hearing on land use item 66. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to uh, hold. We're going to recess for about five minutes for. Uh, Councilmember Cornegy, who uh, has an item coming up, which is uh, land use item 60, four, land use item 64.
a second. I now open the public hearing on land use item 64, the 1618 Fulton Street tax exemption application for property located in Council Member Cornicke's district in Brooklyn. HPD seeks an amendment to previously approved urban development action area project, approval of an article 11 tax exemption for property located at 1612-1624 Fulton Street. The original 1618 Fulton Street application included designation, disposition, project approval, an urban development action area project in order to dispose of three small city owned lots to be merged with five privately owned lots to assemble a site for development of a 100% affordable housing project financed by HPD's M2 term sheet. This application was approved by City Council in August 2017. This application seeks Council's approval for a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption and an amendment to the previously approved project to incorporate the addition of eight units of 40% AMI to be subsidized by project-based Section 8 vouchers. Under the original project, rents were set at tiers affordable to families with incomes below between 57% and 130% of AMI. The amended project will include rents affordable families with incomes between 37% and 130% AMI with my compliments to Council Member Cornegy for re reducing, uh, making it even more affordable by almost 20, by, by 20%. And I'd like to turn it to Council Member Cornegy who has a statement for this project. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, I'm pleased to speak in support of the project. However, I do have a couple of questions in terms of the affordability. As late as uh, last night, we were given uh, some changes uh, made to the level of affordability. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll come back to the questions, obviously, after you've testified. Um, I'm support in, in generally in support of the project, which will not only bring over 50 units of affordable housing to my district, but will also carve out 7,500 square feet of ground floor commercial space parceled out in 100 square foot units for the use of local small business. This means that for the first time in my memory, we've managed to effectively use the ULERP process to not only meet the housing needs of city residents, but at the same time, effectively ensure the service available to them and the retail diversity and viability of the community in which they will live is bolstered as well. Too often, new developments push small businesses owners out of their communities by creating commercial spaces that are realistic accommodation for big box real, uh, re retailers only. In partnership with Juan Barahona and the team at SMJ Development, we were able to ensure that this would not happen with this new project. I look forward to continuing to work with SMJ to ensure these smaller retail spaces are offered to local business owners with favorable terms so they can continue serving the vibrant community for years to come. And I'm happy today to speak in general support of the project mm -hmm. once this affordability question uh, is answered. Thank you, Chair. Fair enough, I wanna thank uh, our, our current Housing and Buildings Chair, uh, Cornegy, for being here, as well as our former Small Business Chair. And if I recall, this was actually the first of its kind affordable small business uh, rezoning. So I just wanna compliment him on that and for continue to drive a tough but good uh, bargain. Uh, I would like to remind HPD that you are still under oath and uh, you may begin. Uh, this particular land use item consists of an amendment to a previously approved project known as 1618 Fulton Street, located at 16 uh, and uh, 1624 Fulton Street and 20 Rear Troy Avenue, Thanks. lots 1699, lots 35, 39, and 43 in Brooklyn Council District 36. The, the development site is made up of vacant city-owned lots within the Fulton Park Urban Renewal Area that were previously approved for disposition by the City Council on November 6, 2013, resolution number, I'm sorry, 2003, resolution number 1144 as part of the second amended Fulton Park Urban Renewal Plan. However, the sites were never developed as planned and remain city owned. On August 24th of 2017, the City Council approved resolution number 1630, designating the three city owned lots as urban development action area project, facilitating disposition to a sponsor selected by HPD who proposes to combine the public sites with adjacent private sites, which are located at block 1699, lots 33, 34, 36, 38, and 137 to create an assemblage in order to construct one 11-story building with a total of 103 dwelling units, including one unit for superintendent, 
The original project estimated initial rent set at tiers affordable to families with incomes between 57% to 130% AMI with incomes targets ranging from 60% to 165% of AMI. Under the amended project, initial rents are affordable towards households with incomes between 37% of AMI and 130% of AMI with income targets ranging from 40% to 165% of AMI. The community facility space uh, will increase from 13,100 square feet to approximately 14,802 square feet, of which 4,000 square feet will be split into a separate unit that will be sold to a third party entity for use as ground floor retail. Under the amended project, the sponsor also seeks Article 11 tax benefits for a term of 40 years. Other aspects of the project remain the same. There will be a mixture of unit types, including uh, studio one, two, and three bedroom apartments. All units will be affordable under an HPD regulatory agreement. Additionally, 20% of the units will be permanently affordable under um, the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program. The building will be energy efficient and residential amenities for the project includes an exercise room and children's playroom, laundry rooms on all residential floors, and a rooftop patio for use by all building tenants. The sponsor has committed to renting ground floor commercial slash community facility spaces to small local businesses. HPD is before the council seek an amendment to the 1611 Fulton Street project as well as approval to Article 11, approval of Article 11 tax benefits for the exemptionary, inclusive of city owned sites as well as private sites in order to help maintain combined affordability of residential units for a term of 40 years coinciding with the regulatory agreement. And to the point of uh, some of the uh, affordabilities being uh, adjusted, it just goes to the point where the financing is constantly changing and then another adjustment had to be made as of last night and we can answer any questions that you might have uh, towards that end. I'm gonna turn it to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Council Member Cornegie for the first set of questions. So what I understand that there has been a change um, as of uh, last night, um, it was my understanding that we were going to get uh, to the 37% AMI through the use of Section 8 vouchers for eight of the units. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand the circumstances around which they've been uh, removed mm -hmm. uh, in terms of H, uh, a HUD. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just want to know if uh, HPD is committed because the developer is committed to preserving those eight units, mm -hmm. but obviously needs the assistance of some program that will allow to do that, not being able to use the Section 8 based vouchers to, to do that at this point to get us to that. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned because without that, it puts us at the 50% AMI mm -hmm. uh, with no real deep affordability. And many people know that I'm not mm -hmm. demanding deeper affordability on all projects. I think that there should be a range, mm -hmm. uh, and that range would be absent without the use of that program mm -hmm. um, uh, that was removed uh, through HUD and the uh, inability to arrive at that. Those eight units are still earmarked by the developer for deep affordability, but without the use of a program, city, state, or federal, it's difficult to make that happen. I want to know if there's a commitment from HPD and the administration to preserve that level of affordability and, and is willing to exhaust all options uh, to do that? I believe the answer to your question is yes, and I'm going to let Mr. Spielberg answer the financing uh, questions uh, to give you an idea of how these units are going to be financed. Um, I mean, as you know, there's a give and take between what is the, um, the, the rents that are in the project versus the financing that can come with it, the amount of debt that can be leveraged, of course, and then there is our subsidy that goes into it. Um, I would say that we are, this development is new and we are looking into all different types of possibilities of how to maintain the levels of affordability that uh, the developer and you and we have been in talking around. So at this moment, that is the, the best I can give you without actually really having to gone through the exercise of exhausting all different possibilities. So, so generally a project like this with that much of a gap uh, may be considered to, to, to halt till we can get to a better place with the affordability. I'm not asking that because I think that there are several uh, members of my community who need housing and, and who are looking for housing. 
but I am ask, asking for some aggressive measures to be taken to preserve that level of affordability in that many units. I think it's, a, it's crucial to the project. It's one of the things that was attractive and had me uh, move from, there were several, and, and my colleague Van Kalos just pointed out to me how many times we've tried to get this project developed over starting in 1985. And we finally arrive at an opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm acutely aware of the history of the project and the importance to my community, you know, in the climate that we're in of affordability. Uh, but I don't want to miss an opportunity uh, uh, because I'm unwilling uh, to review uh, real serious, solid str strategies to get us to those eight units of deep affordability. I also want to mention, I think it's worth noting, uh, that we went from 4,000 square feet of commercial space earmarked for a small mom and pop to 7,500 square feet uh, over the last couple of days because a large, of someone who's going to use a, a large amount of that space uh, recommitted it. So we went from four, th so if we can do that in the commercial space, I believe that we should be able to do that uh, on the residential space, especially when it was earmarked for it. So I don't want to just kind of point the finger at HUD and their inability to get us to a place through Section 8 vouchers of deep affordability and not exercise every opportunity we can on the city level to still meet that, that very, uh, that very um, uh, uh, important need within my community. Under, understood. And I said that we are endeavoring to right now go through the budget and go through what the availability is of, of various different resources to try to make that happen. And, and so here I cannot commit to anything, but we will, we will definitely be working to get back to you very soon. But I'll be honest, I will follow up diligently because I spent a lot of political capital to move this project along. I've worked diligently with my colleagues um, where we've tried to get a range of affordability on projects in my district, and I, and I committed to do that. And I committed to my community and my community board uh, that I would do everything in my power. So I will be following up uh, with you. Understood. Uh, and, and, and exercising uh, every option to get to us to that level. Yeah. Thank you. We'll make sure that we keep, keep we keep you updated as things move along. Thank you. I want to thank Councilman Courtney for his leadership on this and just to piggyback on him. So what is happening here? So 1985 is the first time it's rezoned. And the, the concept here is that when the city is actually doing these rezonings and taking these actions, that something's actually going to happen here and the city's actually going to get the affordability here. So. 1985 is the first action. 2003 is the second amended plan. 2007, we come back yet again. Uh, 2016, we're back again. Uh, I, I imagine my colleague thought we were done in 2017, but we're here again, hopefully for good news. But what's, what's the story here? It's 33 years. I don't have the history of what happened all of those years ago. I, I believe like I got my history from you. Mm, maybe from... Excuse me? We, we received the history from HPD. Okay, I'll, I'll go back to the program folks and get the, get the entire history and uh, try and get you as much more information as we possibly can to see where things fell through the cracks along the way. And, and so in, in granting, so, so initially this was a project was feasible without an Article 11, that's why we're back here again? Um. It was not necessarily, uh, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer, frankly. Um, with the uh, way that uh, financing has worked and with the you know, difficulties uh, of getting all the sources together, um, it was using, it was the, the project was anticipated to go towards uh, using the 421A tax exemption. Um, here it seems that it's more feasible and we can go uh, get more deeply affordable units if uh, we are able to provide the full tax exemption. Uh, what is the uh, what is the tax abatement uh, for the cumulative cost and what is the net present value? The cumulative cost is 27,154,395. Net present value is 6,999,347. Okay, and so just to be clear, the whole project is already in good shape, but that $27 million buys us eight more units at a, a further, a, a reduced affordability. 
Um, I mean, that's not exactly correct. Using the as of right 421A tax exemption that it was using before, there would have been a tax exemption as well. Um, I don't have that number of what that was for you, so I cannot provide the incremental benefit between the 421A and uh, what the Article 11 tax exemption. The Article 11 is a full tax exemption. The 421A, I understand, at least the old 421A, I haven't looked at the new 421A term sheets, but d don't the 421As actually expire gradually? Or would this have been? There would be 25 years of a tax that's set at what the current tax levels are, called the mini tax, if you will. And then there's 10 years in which that gradually then goes away. So it's a 35 year tax exemption with 25 years set at, at the current rates, and then uh, 10 more years of slightly less taxes. And the, the Article 11 is a full abatement of all taxes. This is correct. And so, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, gi given that this project has already gone through the council and this is a matter of the Article 11 for the deeper affordability, I will be working closely with the Land Use Division, the HPD, and uh, Council Member Carnegie on this matter as we uh, make sure that we're getting the, the deepest benefit. But you do not have the different differential between a 421A, uh, the 421A abatement cost versus the uh, Article 11? Not with us, no. So uh, you can you get have that information you to you. Can I see the Article 11 term sheet that you have there? Or what is what is year one? What is this year's? Uh, I, I, give me the sheet and I'll do the math. <laughs> I mean, this is something that we've submitted along with the right, but it's it's right. It's just something that we submitted already. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, we, we will move on to the next item. Is there anyone here to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to close the hearing on this and uh, take about a three minute break. Thank you, Chair Killos.
I will now open the public hearing on land use item 67, the Paul Robeson Houses and Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD seeks approval for partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The subject property includes two buildings totaling 81 units that are fully occupied in HDFC, Robertson, Robeson Apartments, HDFC will acquire fee interest in the exemption area and 1990 ACP Junior Boulevard. Uh, I'm going to guess that's Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, Junior Boulevard will acquire uh, the beneficial interest and will operate the exemption area. The HDFC will provide necessary repairs to the building upon acquisition. Uh, we have a new person on the panel and I will do direct our uh, council uh, to uh, swear them in and remind the other member of the panel that they are still under oath. If you please raise your right hand. Do you uh, affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in answer all council member questions? I affirm. If you can uh, summarize what I just said in plain English, because it was a very complicated, and begin your testimony. <laughs> Land use number 67 consists of an exemption area containing two fully occupied multiple dwellings located at 1995 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard and 1990 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. Um, and is known as Paul Robeson Houses in Manhattan Council District 9. Paul Robeson Houses is a low income Section 8 development currently owned by an Article 5 housing redevelopment company approved for disposition in June 1982 by the Board of Estimates. The project comprises 81 units with a mixture of unit types including two, I'm sorry, 21 bedrooms, 39 two bedrooms, and 21 three bedroom apartments as well as a superintendent's unit. Household AMIs do not exceed 50% of AMI and tenants pay no more than 30% of their income towards rent. There are minimal housing code violations and minimal repairs consist and, and the minimal then minor repairs consisting of flooring upgrades and replacement of kitchen appliances are all that's planned and necessary at this time. The current Article 5 exemption is set to expire in 2022 and the owner will convert to an Article 11 HDFC. In order to help preserve long-term affordability of the low-income rental units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval for the housing company to dissolve their status as an, as an Article 5 terminate their Article 5 tax exemption and enter into a new partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years that will coincide with the term of a regulatory agreement, which will also stipulate that the owner enter into a new 20-year uh, housing assistance program contract with HUD. And um, having the Article 11 in place will help maintain a continued affordability for this development. That's all that the HPD is seeking at this time. Thank you. So basically there's a property and it's being turned over to a new manager? It is. The ownership structure is changing to an Article 11. In order to do that, the current uh, ownership structure has to terminate. And uh, it's fully, how, how many units? It's um, 81. 81 units. And it's fully occupied? That's correct. And so what has, ha so this is an, eight, it's, being converted from one HDFC to a new HDFC with an Article 11? It's converting from an Article 5 redevelopment housing company. Okay, so what is which that? Which is not an HDFC. It is not an HDFC currently. It's so what is an Article 5? Yes, it's an Article 5 entity that will be dissolved. The request is to dissolve the Article 5 entity and convey the property to an Article 11 HDFC. It's just another structure for creating low-income uh, low affordable housing. Okay, and so you've got 81 tenants. What is the reason that they need to convert from their current Article 11 LLC to the HDFC, and why do they need the Article 11? So the current owner is selling the property to a new owner, and the, the new owner is requesting the Article 11 tax exemption. Okay. And so the new, the, the old owner, 
so the old owner couldn't make it marketable anymore. They like what is the the units are rent stabilized, they're rent regulated, or what's the the units are not currently rent registered. They would they were they're under a HAP contract, which means that HUD pays the contract rent, and a tenant pays thirty percent of their income. But under the new structure, the pr the units will be rent registered. Okay, so did the HUD regulation expire? The HUD regulations expire in 2034. And at the end of that time frame, the new owner will enter into a new 20-year HAP contract. It can only be for 20 years, so you have to keep re-upping every 20 years. If HUD is keeping these units affordable through 2034, which is another 16 years, and then they will, don't know what, don't know if we'll be here next week, given what's going on with Syria, but like assuming we are here in 2034. Uh, um, so. so my understanding is that the regulatory agreement for the Article 11 will require that they enter into a new HAP contract once and, the current and it's, one a, it's a partial Article 11, so. It's a partial Article right. 11, and the, the regulatory, so the HAP contract has to remain in effect for the entire regulatory term. Okay, I just give me one moment. Okay, so what is the uh, what is the value of the Article Eleven on this one? The net present value. Hold on one moment. The net present value is six million, six point seven million. You want an exact number, or is six point seven million sufficient? Take the exact number if you'll give it to me. Just one moment. Six million six hundred sixty-nine thousand two hundred sixty-nine. Okay, and do you know what the the cumulative cost over the? It's a forty-year term. Oh, I'm so sorry. I gave you that's the cumulative tax benefit. It's a six million six six nine two six nine. The net present value is two million five one eight two two two. Okay, and that's a forty year? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. And so what does inter you mentioned partial in your testimony, so how much of that is is that a full abatement, a twenty five percent abatement, a fifty year abatement? What's the it's a ten percent. It's sized as ten percent gross rent plus twenty five percent increases going forward. So each time the owner gets a rent increase, uh, the city of New York collects twenty five percent of the difference between the current year's rent and the past year's rent. Okay, give me one moment. That is a new one. So you get 25% of, of rent increases. The difference between one year's rent and the previous year's rent. Okay, and that's how you compute the, uh, okay. And so, why, if there's already the HUD term on this for the next 16 years, why do we need the Article 11 now versus in 16 years or if the HUD agreement ever expires? The, the thought is, is that we are extending affordability for an additional 20 something years by putting the project under a regulatory agreement and in an ideal, well, naturally, the affordability becomes at risk when the, um, and especially given the neighborhood of Harlem, so we are very concerned that existing Section 8 properties which serve the lowest AMI individuals remain intact for the longest period of time. So if we don't act in 2018, right now with the new purchaser, then we will not have another bite at the apple for another 16 years? I believe that's a fair statement. I can't say whether it's true or not, but it's a fair statement. Okay. Uh, and 
we, we don't have any of the parties to this transaction here today, is that correct? Unfortunately, with the scheduling, they were not available. So, so are they doing any work on the project? Is so any of this money necessary for rehabilitation? The the last uh, REACT score on the project, which is what HUD uses to determine its viability, was a very high score. And so as part of the purchase, they are doing necessary repairs and some local law 11 work. Okay, do we know what the value of that work is? Yes, um, the work that they're doing is this, just one moment please. No worries. So the total of immediate repairs that are necessary are the immediate repairs for the uh, local law 11 are $120,000, and the interior floor and appliances are 29435 Okay, so that, it, it does not, I, I was expecting a, a much higher number to warrant the uh, the, the two point five million. Well, dollars. the purchase, the property is being purchased without any subsidy from the city of New York or taxes and bonds. It's a private transaction. Right, but then we're stepping in and giving them two and a half million dollars. And, and in ho I, between two and a half million dollars and six point seven million dollars, with with a handshake, that in uh, twenty years. In 16 years, they will sign a document with HUD that commits them for another 20 years without us having to step back in in 16 years. No, sir. What happens is the regulatory agreement that they execute at closing mandates certain activities. Mm -hmm. As a, In exchange for the tax exemption, they have to maintain a HAB contract throughout the term of the regulatory agreement. They have to have a 20% homeless set aside they have to register the rents with HCR as part of the regulatory agreement. Okay, so there is, in it, so okay, there's a 20% homeless set aside? Yes. Okay, that, great. Uh, and so it is a 40 year article 11, and so they will, and so they're just, and do you know how much the HUD Article 5 is valued at? The Article 5 is currently, I don't have the net present value of it, but to give you an example, this year's taxes for the Article 5 is 143886 but the new exemption will actually increase the first year's taxes to 157277 Okay. And, and so, if so, just to be clear, the the uh, the control is a science person. So, controls you do nothing. If we did nothing, this would remain affordable for 16 years. It would remain under HUD use restrictions until 2034. Yes. And in 20 in 2034. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, thank you. I'll, we'll, we, we will be in touch. This is a helpful testimony. Uh, we will touch base with uh, Council Member uh, Perkins, and uh, if HPD can provide us a uh, similar to what the IBO did of a, a cost per year of affordability uh, for this project versus the additional uh, HUD Article Five, so that would be starting at 2034 and then counting out those 24 years, how much. Uh, the uh, $6.6 .6 million goes for per unit and just helping us get a sense of what we're buying. Yes, yeah, sir. I would just, if you don't mind, if I can make one further comment. Yes. Um, the population being served in this building pays about, they pay 30% of their income. The average AMI for the tenants in this building it averages 20% of AMI considering that the median income in community board not 10 is $46,000 a year. Um, this is a very low income population, so HPD has a very vested interest in ensuring that the lowest income population in Central Harlem are not dislocated. I, I, I absolutely support it. I'm just, it, it looks like it's a 
just doing the math now, it's about $280,000 per year for those 24 additional years that we're hoping to get. Uh, and so it's also helpful to know what the HUD subsidy is. So it's a quarter million, and then if you break it out by units, it comes out to about 3,500 per unit, which may be a very good deal, but I just wanna get your numbers on it and make sure that we're getting our, our money's worth. And then also just looking at net present value and whether or not we're able to even structure it so that the Article 11 perhaps doesn't kick in until uh, 2034 uh, when they may actually start needing some of the subsidies or when the, the units are at risk. If I could just make the further point that the, art, that the tax abatement that's on the property now expires in 2022. So. Okay, so what's currently on it? It's, Article 5 has their own type of tax abatement that will expire in 2022. So if we did nothing and that, and that abatement expires, but that only the HAP contract is in place, there's still no tax abatement against this property, correct? And there's the also the potential for the property to go market at that time in 2022. Thank you for bringing that up, Artie. Mm -hmm. that, when that the Article 5 okay. dissolves, Article 5 has a 40-year term and it dissolves by itself. So um, at that point, there would be, the city would have very little leverage in wrapping, into, wrapping this project into a regulatory regime. So th that is helpful information to, to learn. I, I would have liked to, and Artie, thanks for bringing it up. I don't mm -hmm. think either of us knew about that. So it isn't 2034, it's 2022. So it's four years that the units will be there no matter what. And then in 2022, mm -hmm. so wh what happens in 2022 versus what happens in 2034? So the tax abatement that's on the property now expires in 2022, but the HAP contract that's in place now expires in 2020, 2034. So the HAP contract might still be in place, but there will be no tax abatement on the property, and those rents are not rent regulated, correct? They're not rent regulated, and also, more importantly, the restrictions that, because right now under the Article 5, the city has the ability to do actions such as this. Once 2022 comes around and then 2023, HPD loses the, and the city loses the ability to opine on whether or not this project will remain a Section 8 property it would be up to the owner's discretion because they would have fulfilled their original 40-year agreement. Thank you. So is anyone here to testify on this item? Seeing none, I will uh, close the uh, public hearing on uh, land use item number 67. Uh, the next item on the agenda will be uh, We'll now open public hearing on land use item 69, the Archer Green Tax Exemption application for property located in Council Member Miller's District in Queens. HPD seeks approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years, Archer Green Apartments Housing Development Fund Corporation. HDFC would acquire property and Archer Green Apartments LP, a limited liability partnership would be the owner and operator of the property. Collectively, these two organizations will acquire and construct the property with loans from NYC HDC and HPD with Low income housing tax credits, the owners would enter into regulatory agreement with HPD to establish controls on the operation of the property. Approval would facilitate a mixed use building with a residential tower above a base with the commercial and community facility uses. The residential tower is expected to include 387 affordable units. Uh, I see a new person, so we will uh, direct the council to, uh, if you can identify yourself, your name, and then the council will uh, swear you in, and I remind the other members that they are still under oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the testimony you're about to provide and in answer to all council member questions? I do. You may begin. Okay. Land use number 69 consists of an exemption area located 92 33 168th Street, block uh, 10209, lot 115 in Queens, Council District 27. Now known as Archer Green, the site is comprised of an underutilized two-story parking garage that is partially occupied by the New York City Police Department. The project area was awarded to the sponsor in June 2016 as part of a request for proposals issued in 2015 by the Economic Development Corporation. Redevelopment at the site entails the construction of two residential towers above a commercial and community facility base. Disposition of the site will be handled by EDC and through HPD's mix and match program, development at the site will be undertaken by the sponsor. 
currently the plan is to construct one 19-story tower and one 23-story tower that will have a total of 387 units of 100% affordable rental housing with a mixture of unit types, including 38 studios, 161 bedrooms, uh, 164 two-bedrooms, and 24 three-bedroom apartments, plus a superintendent's unit. Under the Mix and Match program, household targets will range from 40% to 130% of AMI uh, for a family of three with rents ranging from 37% AMI to 100% AMI, uh, which is roughly $475 for a studio to $2,406 for a three-bedroom apartment. The building will be constructed to meet green enterprise green community certification. The commercial space will be comprised of 69,000 square feet of com uh, and, commercial and community facility space will be comprised of 15,000 square feet. Commercial businesses anticipated for the site include grocery store or supermarket. Community facility space is expected to be occupied by adult daycare or domestic violence center. Additional amenities include an underground, underground parking spaces. Of the 210 spaces, 60 will be reserved for the NYPD, 67 reserved for tenants, and 83 commercial spaces. Other amenities planned for the project are community room and a shared kitchen, facilities, and rooftop terrace. In order to help facilitate long-term affordability of the rental units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee today, seeking Article 11 tax benefits. Uh, the commercial and community facility spaces are excluded from the exemption area. Thank you. We're just here to answer questions. Yeah. Great. Uh, so the only thing being sought here is an Article 11? That's correct. What is the uh, value over the 40 years for the Article 11? One second. Uh, $96,702,691. Sorry, one more time, 96 million. 720,691. Okay, and the net present value is 19.486150. The net present value, according to this, is 27 uh, million, 20,979. Okay, thank you. So I guess the, the first question is, so this is, this is new construction? Yes. Yes, new construction. And it's two towers at? Uh, two, two towers with commercial space on the bottom. Great. Uh, so I guess first question is, uh, it looks like uh, y you, you win the day with the uh, most units. Uh, actually probably more units than, than everyone else put together at uh, 387 units. Uh, are, the, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you getting HPD financing? And yes, we're, you, we're getting the, the financing consists of uh, you know, volume cap from HDC of approximately 52 million uh, in addition to recycled bonds of about 27 million HDC subsidy, approximately 39 million. Uh, HPD s subsidy, about 41 million. Uh, low income housing tax credit proceeds of about $43.8 million. Uh, in addition, there'll be developer equity of approximately $11 million in this deal. And a bank loan for the retail space for about $11 million. Thank you for your transparency. Uh, LIHT, are you getting low income housing tax credit as well? Yes, that's the, that's the syndication proceeds. Great. Uh, any other sources of uh, funding? No. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, transparency. If HPD can just outline the, the terms and programs and just a supplemental uh, handout, that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, uh, we'll get that information to you. And I, I can't help but reiterate that these are just estimates. They're always all, that's all we can give your estimates because the financing does change. Uh, un understood, and just hoping that these are in the ballpark, and that if somebody is saying uh, 
that, that if we're saying 52 million, that there wasn't really 100 million. If it's like 52 oh. million, but it ends up being uh, 57 million, I don't think that's yeah. the big thing. We're just trying to get a ballpark. Uh, what did the total project cost? 207 million. 207 million. That's hard and soft cost. Perfect. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, what are the soft costs? Uh, the, the the hard costs are about 135 million, so that's about 70 million dollars of soft various soft costs. Uh, what what are soft costs? It could be financing costs, insurance okay. costs. Uh, there's a lot. Of, this is a large project. So 72 million in soft costs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you've been here for the whole for the whole day from two o'clock on, so you, I think yes. you know the other questions that are coming. So um, the the next question would be: uh, Are you as a developer in MWBE, or are any of the uh, consultants, engineers, or construction companies MWBEs, or have leadership that are uh, minority or? We're not an MWB company. We're a for-profit company, since that'll be the next question. Uh, but uh, we have, you know, we have our MWB goals that we're going to meet. Uh, we have uh, extensive goals. If you'd like me to read them to you, I can read them to you. This project's goals: uh, the MWB participation. It's the goals are. 20% uh, MWB in total dollar value, uh, ten in addition to 10% WB in total dollar value. Uh, then we have- is it, is it 20 or 10 or 30 together? 30 together, 20 plus 10. Okay, so that so it is fair to say 30 together? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank then you. Then we have local enterprise participation. Uh, we That's for Queens and that's 25% is the goal. And is that the same as local hire, it, or is it? That's part of it, yes. Then we okay. also have, in addition to, we have local workforce participation, which will be the zip code particular. And what is that goal? Uh, that's, hold on one second. Commercial. Well, that's the fifth, I'm sorry, that's 15% the Southeast Queens. That's the fifteen percent of Southeast Queens. That's the goal. And so, one was enterprise, and so one it's twenty-five percent total dollar value is Queens, of which 20, 15 percent the goal is to be in Southeast Queens. Okay, so fifteen percent of twenty-five percent, or fifteen, and then ten percent is, is Queens wide. Twenty-five percent is, I guess, all Queens. Fifteen of it should be Southeast Queens, I believe. Okay. Thank you for the <laughs> transparency and clarity. Uh, and then the uh, next question on the uh, construction side and operation side, will folks doing the actual work or operations have health insurance, disability insurance, or pension benefits, uh, as well as a wage that is commensurate with uh, surrounding job sites? Well, it, this is a non-prevailing wage job. Mm -hmm. uh, the third-party contractor, it's Latier in this uh, case, uh, they will oversee the construction portion uh, of the project. Uh, this is a living wage project, uh, so uh, people will be paid, you know, a living wage uh, in the jobs. In terms of long term, the maintenance staff in the building, once the building uh, will be built, will be 32 BJ, so the maintenance staff uh, will receive all the benefits that are customary for 32 BJ workers. Uh, we were we were just joined by Council Member Carnegie, who has pioneered uh, bringing uh, affordable uh, business spaces. Is there any opportunity to make commercial space uh, affordable for mom and pops or to? Uh, target retailers that will be have a smaller footprint versus one large well, footprint or in the alternative if there is need for uh, uh, 
schools or supermarkets in this part of the city? Uh, what, what, are, what are your thoughts for the 69,000 of community facility and uh, 15,000 commercial? Well, in terms of the retail, the 69,000 square feet, it's going to be a mix of retailers, and we certainly hope that a portion of it are going to be smaller local retailers. Are, are you willing to make a commitment to how many of them? I can't make a commitment at this time. Gotcha. Okay. I think uh, those are all of the uh, questions that I've been uh, asking. Give me one other moment. Um, for HPD, how does this project fit into the larger planning process for the area outlined in the Jamaica Now Neighborhood Action Plan? I don't have an answer to that question right now. I'll have to get the information to get back to you. Perfect. Uh, well, not perfect, but if we can have that. And similarly for uh, back to the commercial space, it, it appears that our team believes a grocery store may be advantageous here. Do you know if your site is available for the FRESH program? And uh, if, there, if, if there's a desire from the developer to actually bring in a, an affordable fresh grocer for the neighborhood? There is a lease signed with an affordable fresh grocer that participates in the fresh program uh, that will take part of the 68,000 square feet. And I imagine somewhere along this 15,000 to 20,000 square feet? Yes, that's the plan. Fair enough, okay. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, do we have anyone else who wishes to testify on this project? So I have Bryant Brown uh, from uh, 32BJ. I'll, I'll excuse this panel. I have Bryant Brown from 32BJ, and then I also have. Perfect. I, I have somebody else from HPD who signed up to speak. Okay. So uh, this will be our last panel of the day. five minutes, but you do not need to use all five. Understood. Thank you. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Brown, um, and I am here speaking on behalf of the 80,000 building service workers represented by 32BJ in New York City, and in particular, the 35,000 residential building service workers. Uh, as was said earlier, all over the city, our members work in buildings like the residential building that will be developed at 9233 168th Street. According to press reports, and as was said earlier, the Archer Green development will bring 387 affordable apartments to downtown Jamaica, along with 69,000 square feet of retail space and 15,000 square feet of community space. This important project should also create good jobs for the local community. Omni Development won the RFP to develop the site on 168th Street in early 2017. The project is part of the Jamaica Now Neighborhood Action Plan, one of the goals of which is to create a robust economy, in quotation marks, uh, providing good jobs for residents. In recognition of this goal, the RFP for the 168th Street site included a preference for project proposals that included plans to pay building service workers the prevailing wage, a wage and benefit package that allows building service workers to raise families in New York City. Uh, when the Archer Green project is complete, we estimate it will employ roughly nine full-time building service workers. Um, and we're here to urge the council to ensure that Omni is fully committed to making these jobs high quality jobs that serve the community um, as far as I understand from my team uh, from earlier today, we have been in conversation with Omni about this project. And again, this, as the message was relayed to me earlier today, they have yet to make a, f a formal uh, commitment to good jobs, and we're happy to keep the council updated as those conversations continue. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who's here to testify on this item? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this application. All the items we held Hearings on today, as well as Land Use 68, will be laid over. I would like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.